tiny cemetery. We've gone out there every year for his anniversary date when we do our walk. And we started six years ago. This year will be the sixth walk, and it's open to the public. And we encourage people to come and join us, and it's just a summer thing. Um, we don't do a lot of fanfare with it. We talk at the beginning. We meet at Kimball Lake Drive where Eric walked, started walking home alone that night by himself on June 26th. And then we walk the walk that Eric would have taken, the route he took, up east, up um, Y Avenue to um, Silver Street. And we actually stand on the corner in the grass lot now that used to be the little corner store where Eric made it to and then never, and then was never seen alive again. Um, and we stop there just out of respect for the family that lives in the house currently. Um, because I, it's not fair to them to have all of us stand in, in their driveway or anything like that. So we stop at the corner, but that's where Eric was alive last and, and seen alive last by witnesses. And we walk there, and then we have we, we pose in front of one of his billboards that we, we save all of his billboards when they're taken down, and we reuse them. And then we um, we uh, pose with a group as a group picture to mark each year with him you know, 18 feet tall or whatever behind us. And then um, after we have a few words there at the end, last year, uh, retired under Sheriff Matches, who still works on the case, he spoke to all of us. He shared many things um, that, you know, we, a lot of people, I knew him, but a lot of people were like, wow, I can't believe all this has been going on behind the scenes. And, and they've all been able to continue to get away with this. Okay, so I got a hold of somebody that I can talk to, um, Justice for Eric Cross. Um, she runs the Facebook page and uh, her name is her name is Melissa Hatfield and um, she agreed to do a phone interview with me so I am going to call her. Hello. Hi, is this Melissa? This is. Hi, this is Trina. Hey, Trina. How are you doing so, today? <laughs> I'm doing good. So you want to talk about Eric? Yes. I always like to talk about Eric. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, yep, you can ask me anything. Um, I'll, if I can't tell you, then I'll just tell you that. But I can give you, like, overview or whatever you want. On, on Facebook and for a while and watching, you know, and seeing what you're doing. And um, I started really getting involved in the whole thing and I just I just want to see you know if what we can do to help get the word out about Eric Cross. Absolutely and, and that's that's actually you know the biggest reason that I, I organize it and do it the way we do it is because um, it's just the awareness part because you know just in the since we've we've exploded on Twitter or um, uh, TikTok and because I'm seeing a shift in all these different social medias, and I've got to get our, our website and stuff up and updated and stuff like that, because the person I had running it's kind of busy right now. But um, that's been the whole focus is just awareness and giving them no place to hide anymore. Um, you know, and just because as long as no one talks about it or shares it, then they the killers benefit. So that's what we've been trying to do is just keep it out there. Absolutely. Um, Eric, uh, Eric was new to the Vicksburg area the fall before, so the fall of '82, to the Vicksburg schools. <laughs> Excuse me. His family moved due to his dad taking a different job um, near Vicksburg, not in Vicksburg, and so he was new to the school, and he was, you know, he was just trying to fit in, meet friends, and, and make new friends and stuff. And typical 16-year-old boy. Um, he was going, he started hanging out with a group of kids, uh, including um, one of them is named as a suspect, Bill Cook. And he was around Brenton Spaulding, who's the, uh, prime, uh, the prime suspect. And then he would have classes with Amber Thomas, who is the other prime suspect. Um, and uh, she would flirt with him. He would flirt with her, just typical teenage kids, you know, being kids. And then um, Brent would get jealous of that and stuff. And, and um Amber had a lot of other boyfriends, so Eric wasn't, like, special to her, but to him, I think she was kind of special. Um, Brent would um, basically just harass and attack Eric in the school building um, the summer, right before school got out for summer vacation. So it had escalated. Um, there was a, one day when I personally um, was 
caught up in, in one of the uh, fights that they had. I was coming out of my first hour class, which was an upstairs hallway. And in Vicksburg, there's um, 400 hall, or 100, 200, 300, 400 hall. And so I was in the 200 hall, which is right above the, on the parking lot side of the building, the main entrance. And I was in my first hour class and Eric was like kitty corner across the hall from that class. I didn't know it until we, we, the bell rang and we were exchanging classes. And as we walked out of our room, our, we just kind of got shoved by a group of kids and the teacher up against the lockers near where we were coming out. And they just said, stay back. And all of a sudden it was like these three male teachers were breaking up a fight and, you know, and asking what was going on and stuff. Kids said, well, when Eric and Amber came out of the classroom with other kids, they were just giggling and joking around. But Brent had gotten out of whatever class he was in early and was waiting. And as they came out of that classroom, he jumped Eric right there in the hallway. So he was just always so jealous and so, you know, always like ready to be a, a, an attack in attack mode and things like that. So that kind of continued um, up until the end of school because uh, there was another time where as you're changing classes, you'd have to walk through, I um, can't think of the name of it right now, but it was like a common area where pop machines, uh, snack machines and stuff, and, and, and kids would, uh, like, they would have a school store where you could buy snacks if you didn't want to go and buy lunch, or you'd just go on the other side of that same hallway, and there was the lunchroom. Well, as Eric was changing classes, because, you know, they broke us up into different lunch groups because of the size of the school, so you'd have early lunch or late lunch, and Eric had a late lunch, and Brent apparently had an early lunch, and as Eric's walking from one side of the building to the other through that area, Brent just came out of nowhere running and tackled him into the pop machines and just got up and laughed while Eric's on the floor, you know, trying to get up and stunned at what happened to him. And kids would actually talk to Amber and say, look, you have to talk to your boyfriend. He's jealous. He's going to hurt that kid. He's, he's already, you know, he's attacking him in school. You need to tell him, and she would just laugh it off, or she'd say, I know, but, you know, it's, it's nothing I can do. And it's like, you can because you're causing this. And, and, you know, but she would kind of ignore it. But these were actual go other guys that, would, that were friends with her that say, listen, he's going to hurt that kid if you don't stop this. And she'd continue to flirt with Eric, and, and, and I think she liked the attention she was getting from all the boys, whether it be Brent beating up Eric or attacking Eric. That was, a, in a way, you know, she kind of enjoyed that a little bit because she never did stop the behavior. So then school gets out, and this was a graduation party that uh, Eric had heard of. Um, all kids at the school because they were passing around flyers for this boy's graduation party. And it was at the, it was going to be at a little lake house in this in you know on June 20, 25th, and it was a Saturday, and it was in the summer in Vicksburg, and not a lot going on way out there in the country except for um, you know tours and mm -hmm. and um, all kinds of stuff that you had to do in the summer for summer jobs and things like that, but not a lot going on. So all these kids started telling other kids, hey, about this party. Even if they didn't get invited, they'd tell other kids. So um, Eric and Bill Cook had decided they were going to go, <coughs> excuse me, and at the same time, Amber had decided she was going to go with Brent's sister, Mybrit. So they arranged, um, according to witness statements from Amber and Mybrit, they had arranged that Amber was going to spend the night with her on Saturday so they could go to this party. So they, um, Amber is supposed to come over, spend the day and the night with her. They go to the party and, and meet up with Bill Cook, who at the time was dating Myrit Spalding, um, Brent's younger sister. And so, you know, as the story goes, uh, there's so many versions of it because they lied so much, which is more proof of how much they were trying to cover up what they had done. But they they all go to this party at different times, and they they continue to lie and try to say they weren't even there. Um, and but witnesses put them all there at the party. Sometime during the night, as, as, as the night's going on, Eric is just drinking because it costs $2 to get in for this kegger. And Eric goes there with Bill. They pay their 2 bucks because Eric actually borrowed the $2 from his dad as he was leaving the house. His dad didn't know that he needed to get into the party because his parents weren't aware he was going to this party. They thought he was going over to hang out at Bill's house. And Bill actually was living with his uncle. 
uh, at the time, not his parents. Um, so Eric's dad, at the, his mom was gone for a meeting, and so his dad said, okay, we'll just get $2 out of my wallet, and uh, Eric got the $2 out of the wallet and got on his dirt bike and took off and then came back and left his dirt bike and then walked up back up to the corner. He got he had gotten to the corner on his dirt bike or his motorcycle and one of their friends drove by and said, Hey, I'll pick you up on my way back and they said, Okay, so he took his bike home, went back to the corner, stood there for a few minutes, they picked they came back, picked him up, and then they picked up Bill Cook and then they went to the party. And then um they met up with Bill's girlfriend, Mybert, which was the original plan. And then Amber was with Mybert, and so was the younger Spalding brother. Well, the night goes on, everybody's getting along fine, and then all of a sudden Brent shows up. And once Brent shows up, the whole mood of the party changes, the attitude of the group that were hanging around together changes, and all of a sudden Eric becomes the target of, of Brent, and he starts bullying him, and he asks him why he's even at the party. No one wants him there. You know, he just starts bullying him as usual. And there are witnesses that say that Brent punched Eric, and Eric fell to the ground. There are other, and, and then Brent um, reached down and said, oh, we're cool, buddy, we're cool, and kind of helped him up because Eric couldn't get back up. There are other witnesses that say they, they, um, they actually were leaving the party because they heard, they saw Eric who, was, who hadn't had a problem with anyone all night, even the mom that it was her son's party said Eric was a gentleman all night. He was just a good kid. He was quiet. He was laughing. He was having a good time. He was meeting new people. He was hanging out with people that he knew from school. And then these these uh, there's a couple witnesses that say that all of a sudden at a certain time at night they start hearing Eric yelling and screaming and somebody's yelling and screaming at him and he's re replying to them yelling and screaming. And it's in the same area where people witnessed Brent punch him. Well, Amber stood by him and um, Tim Martin, who's also a suspect. And then the stories start to vary on whether Eric was actually beaten up there, tied up to the back of the car, and dragged up that driveway and out onto the road and down the street. Because, But there's also witnesses that say that the group left, but Eric had already started walking home after the screaming match out in the, out in the parking area. Um, and people actually witnessed him making it all the way almost to Silver Street, which is where the other witnesses put the kids in the car, Brent, Amber, Tim, the younger sister, the younger brother, and another individual that they could see standing a tall six foot, six foot one, white male, blonde hair, standing between the two cars that were facing opposite directions, parked at the little corner store. Eric walked past um, houses and stuff. They actually spoke. They actually tried to speak to him, and he was, you know, he was drunk. He was out of it. He fell down. They said, what are you doing, Eric? And they said they watched him for a few minutes. He didn't respond, but he kind of crouched like he was trying to figure out, okay, where am I? But he had told people he's leaving. I'm going, I'm walking home. I'm going home. I'm going home. Okay, well, we'll see you, we'll see you later. So they watched him walk. They all saw him leave. They know what time he left. We know what time he left. We know what time he um, got up to that corner. And from the moment he hit that corner, he disappeared. But that is when he would have come into contact with those two groups of two cars full of teenagers. And those, all those teenagers, except for one, I think hasn't been. I know one hasn't been um, uh, publicly named yet. But there are a couple more involved that have not been named that the police are just, I think, just now starting to realize that are involved. But um, Eric made it because there was a witness that wasn't connected to the party at all that saw him walking up to the corner on the opposite side where he would have crossed that road. And he would have been just, you know, maybe a football length, football field away from his driveway. And he hit that corner, and then other kids have said over the years that there was a fight at the, at the party store on the corner, the little store, and then Eric was gone. Well, Eric's, the majority of the uh, evidence and blood and everything um, is right directly in front of, like, Eric's mailbox at the end of his driveway, his family's driveway. So, you know, he bled out there, but uh, what the variations of the story start there once he comes up missing. He was beaten. He was beaten savagely. I mean, he was 
He was internally decapitated. <clears throat> his back had an indent in it of a big round circle that went through the skin into the muscle tissue and was a permanent fixture in his back down near the base of his, um, almost not, not completely to the base of his spine, so above the hip area, but low back. He had a crushed um, occipital bone, which meant he took the injuries that he had to his body through the autopsy and stuff, and speaking with four different trauma nurses and, and uh, other experts, his injuries were not from being run over by the car. The types of injuries his body sustained before he was run over are what killed him, and then the car running him over and dragging him for many, many, many yards down the road, um, and then him coming either probably just coming out the back of the car finally. Um, that kind of just masked a little bit what was physically done to him before he was dragged, or the beating took place after they dragged him, but most of the beating took place before they um, ran him over, ran him down. Now, some of the people have claimed um, that Brent said he just wanted, he was just going to run him down. I just wanted to run him down because he was jealous of Amber from the party because she had told him, hey, Eric's been flirting with me tonight. Well, Eric, Brent and Amber both put out that Eric was gay. And it's like, well, if you, if you say Eric was gay, then why would Eric be flirting with your girlfriend? Why are you jealous of Eric flirting with your girlfriend if you say he he's LGBTQ? Well, Eric, Eric wasn't, but if Eric was, that was Eric's business, and Eric never came out if he was. So why are you trying to use that as an excuse for why this would happen to him? Because then, to me, it's a hate crime, and it should be prosecuted as one. But... Eric was flirting with her in school. Eric was flirting with her, and she was flirting back with him. So um, I know how that works, so I can't see that he would have been LGBTQ, so they were just ha trying to come up with excuses that they felt people would find okay with why they killed him. There have been variations on the stories, but basically he was um, beaten, savagely murdered, um, and then... You know, the police over the years have always said that it was a hit and run to cover up what they had done to him. Eric's body tissue, hair, um, the DNA evidence is from bumper, front bumper to rear bumper under the whole base of the car. Um, now, after, this, after a few months in the summer, Brent continued to drive this car. That car disappeared, just disappeared off the face of the earth. And that has always been considered, you know, a murder, a murder weapon in some way, but the car is not actually necessary to be found to prosecute this case. Um, all they have wanted really is just one of the people in the car to take a full immunity deal, which Amber Thomas, um, who is now Amber Masick, uh, she told them, I will talk, but I want, a f I want full immunity. So they Michigan Attorney General's office wrote it up, got it approved by a judge, and then when she went back in to sign it, because first of all, she had to tell what she knew and what, what happened before they would agree to the deal. So that must it must have been enough that they agreed to the deal, but then when she was supposed to come back and sign that deal, she went back and said, um, I plead the fifth. Fill you guys in about what is about to actually take place. Now, we are trying to do a little investigation paranormally with this Eric Cross investigation. It is about 37 year old cold case. It is one of the longest cold case files throughout Kalamazoo, Michigan, if not all of Michigan. And we are trying to get the bottom of this and try to figure this out for the family of Eric Cross. So with that said, we are going to go out there and do a spirit box at Eric Cross's headstone and see if he has anything further to say to us through the spirit box and see if we can't get to the bottom of this. Things happened. Um, so I pretty much want to know a few things, so I'm going to ask you. Um, 
Give me a name on, on who killed you. Here, you hold it. Can you give me a name on, um, who did this to you? Eric, I want I want to know who did this to you. Are you happy now? Are you with your family? I heard two yeses. I'm really sorry what happened to you. You didn't deserve that. But you have a lot of people that are pulling for you um, to get justice for Eric Cross. I know you don't know who I am, but can you tell me who did this to you? Yeah, I'm really creeped out. How about you? Are you creeped out? That just said Eric. Did it really? Hi. That said hi. Hi, Eric. I say yes sir, hi. I'm gonna turn this necrophonic app off and I want you to talk to me. I want you to talk to me without the necrophonics. I want you to speak into the camera. I am here trying to get answers for you to help your family out. Would you please tell me who did this to you? Did you hear that? Yeah. Somebody just fucking screamed. Totally ridiculous because the reason you were given a full immunity deal, which, by the way, is not something that they just give freely. There has to be a reason for them to give you a deal like that. And they they were just dumbfounded. They're, you know, they couldn't believe that she's walking away from a deal that could... She, I mean, if she would have killed Jimmy Hoffa if he was in the car with Eric Cross, she would have got away with it because they would hold her accountable for nothing during that time period. And she pled the fifth because she, she said it would implicate her if she talked. It's like, no, it won't. You, you get away free. This is your get out of jail free card. And you get your slate wiped clean. And when the trial's over, once you testify, you move on. The rest of them go to prison. Because when they found out, they were angry. And they were, they were just shocked at the mistake and how the cover-up kind of began there, too. So it's like we've had all these years of nobody doing their jobs correctly no follow-up for eric in the 80s uh the police didn't follow up the courts didn't follow up the prosecutors didn't follow up on many times where they could have charged these people for other things that would have put them in jail that would have actually helped them have leverage to move eric's case forward and get 
get the information, but they just didn't do their jobs. And when you go back and ask, they just say, we didn't follow up. We, yeah, we just didn't follow up. Yeah, we didn't do that. We didn't go and we should have done that or whatever. And it's like, well, what, what was it about this 16 year old boy from, from the, the Bayside area of Michigan that moved to Vicksburg, Michigan, that you just didn't care or you purposely you is there a reason you manipulated this case or didn't do anything for this case the way you should have done and is it because and you know all the the years growing up it was always rumored that that brian spaulding senior who is brent's dad and my brit's dad because all three of his kids were in the car that night yeah, they have three children. All three of them are in the car. If Mybert hadn't died in 2007, I think it was, of cancer, she would also have an arrest warrant. She would be a suspect in this case as well. The youngest brother is the only one that hasn't been named, and I don't know how long that will last because I think once the truth starts coming out, he is going to be named as well. Um, and uh, I believe Tim Martin's brother will be named as well, too. But there's others that were involved that night, and they can be classified as conspirators, if not suspects. Um, but w- one of the biggest things that always has gone around Vicksburg and continues is that this uh, urban myth or conspiracy theory that the Spalding dad paid people off. Which, and we know that the dad ha- was the first one to say, if I he was very open and he spoke with the police freely, and but yet he said, if I go home tonight and I find out my son is involved. You'll never hear from us or see us again. And guess what? The Those three kids never got interviewed again until Brent went in as an adult on his own and it pissed his dad off. Those um, three kids have brief, brief um, interviews. And they basically, like, my Brits was identical to Amber's. I mean, it was almost like they just photocopied it and signed the bottoms uh, in some cases. And, and there is one set of... Um, interview sheets where it literally looks like they photocopied five copies and they all signed it because their stories were so identical like to the word to the letter on on most of their statement that you could tell that they all rehearsed what they were going to say and what they were going to tell the police in one of their last interviews and i mean when as much alcohol and, and drugs as they were consuming and stuff that night the fact that they could all remember this as detailed as they did but it was identical and it was the same story where they, they always were together and no one ever saw Eric and things like that. When we know from, you know, 181 other people that, yeah, Eric was there. Yeah, they were there. Yeah, they were around him. Yeah, they were with him. Brent picked on him. Brent bullied him. Brent punched him. But yet the way they all told the story was basically they wrote a story and they each handed that same story into the police. Okay, so I want to start out with the Necrophonics app. This seems to get like the most um, accurate uh, responses that we we can find. So this is the um, headstone. It's got a cat and a dog on it. Sorry, I'm not still. Okay, here we go. All right, Eric, we are here. We want to ask a few questions to see if we can get some answers. Here we go. Eric Cross, I am talking to only Eric Cross. Everybody else, I am not speaking with you right now. I only want Eric Cross to come through. Okay. Eric Cross, who killed you? Cross. Tell me who was involved in your murder. Oh. 
I would like to know the murderer's name, please. Okay. Was Brent Spaulding? He is the main the main person of interest. Was Brent Spaulding the one who killed you? Did Bill Cook have anything to do with your murder? Was Amber Thomas involved in your death on June 26, 1983? No. No? Now, if I understand this right, Bill Cook was your best friend. Is he 100% innocent in your death? That's a big no. Did Amber Thomas have any wrongful or ill tensions that night on June 26, 1983? Pretty sure I heard a yeah. Is Amber Thomas coming covering up for Brent Spaulding? What? Team? Oh. I'm sorry, I'm shaking. Oh. <laughs> Was Tim Martin involved in your death? I just say it, that's us. I thought you said that's sus. <laughs> Can you tell me something about that night that you died that may help um, convict the murderers that nobody else may know about? All right, Eric, did you know it's been 30, almost 38 years since you died? I am here to get some answers for you and your family. Did you say we are here? Did it? Would you please give me the names of the person or persons who did this to you? If I'm not mistaken, that just said a lot of names. Did it really? If any names do pop up that correlate with um, anything that has to do with Eric Cross, this is 100% legit because we have not mentioned these names before. Just think, this is only our second time doing a spirit box at this location. Can you tell me where some evidence that may not be known about is at? Maybe something that they overlooked. Tell me where this evidence is at.
Who's involved in killing you that night on June 26, 1983, that nobody may know about? Eric, will you please tell me who was involved in your death that we may not know about? Jody? I would be totally wrong on that, though. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and cut this session off, and I'm going to um, go grab the um, SP-7 um, spirit box. So now that we have the SP-7, we're going to ask a couple questions again. Same one. Tell me who was involved in your murder. Would you please tell me who killed you? You notice the wind picks up every time you try to ask questions. And not just like more your everyday questions, like actual in the depth questions. people were involved. I just want to tell you and your family, I'm really sorry for what happened to you. I am not related or friends or family with anybody involved in um, this case. I don't know anybody in, involved in any of this. Um, I just, I really liked the story and I wanted to, um, look for, sorry, I wanted to look further into it because I'm hoping that soon there will be justice for Eric. We need justice for Eric. And we want to help his family and and loved ones. So, Eric, I just want to tell you that I'm really sorry for what happened to you. You didn't deserve that. Nobody does. And I really hope you're resting in heaven. And you're 
looking down on everybody right now and just 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 help these people out and finding out who did this to you just point them in the right direction just whisper in their ear or something just do something to help with putting away the people who did this to you godspeed eric cross sneak off to meet him so it's like but I, I thought you were afraid of him nope she's never been afraid of him which tells you that she's very evil if she's not afraid of a guy that could do this and she would sneak off to meet him still while she was also dating other boys that were there that night and witnessed many things so it tells you a lot about the people the individuals they're not really people the individuals that uh because they're not human they don't have any souls they don't have any heart they don't have any consciences and um the fact that amber would go and and spill her guts to the michigan attorney general and then basically plead the fifth so they couldn't use it against her um is, is, and the fact that the Attorney General would hand that back to Kalamazoo and, and put it on their lap when she, her office has detectives that are all some of the highest ranking retired detectives in the state of Michigan, and they work for her in that office. That's how they become those detectives. They're all retired, so they're drawn a pension from their original departments, and now they're being paid by the state of Michigan to be Attorney General detectives. So why they aren't doing more um, but they put it back on Kalamazoo and uh, the sheriff's office who had the case since 1983 anyway. And they did their job in the two th from 2000 on to, to today. They've done their job um, and they prepared a case that was winnable and was ready to go. And then they were let down by the just us system. That's absolutely amazing. And that is one of the reasons that we push so hard. You know, we, we get asked all the time, why don't you just let it go? And it's like, if this was your kid, would you let it go if somebody murdered them and just walked away and laughed in your face? Oh, no. Or their friends wrote to you and said, you know, uh, oh, you guys should just let this go. It's ridiculous. Even if it did happen. It's like, even if it did happen, do you want to see where he's buried? I have a picture of his headstone. I put it up occasionally. He's buried in a little cemetery out in Menden, Michigan. It is an old country.